Hey everyone, this is a tutorial where we're going to go over step by step how I got a branch like this using macro photography and photogrammetry. So this here is 133 million polygons, almost 134 million polygons. Uh, there's an incredible amount of detail, as you can tell. It looks great. Let's look at the solid view. It's a little bit easier to see the surface in the solid view. Give it a second here. <laughs> it's it's a lot of polygons to load up. There we go. Okay. So we'll go get a little tighter in here and see uh, the kind of detail that we're getting. So that's what we're going for. And from something like this, we can bake out maps. And those maps can be put onto all kinds of 3D assets and make them look extremely realistic. All right, so let's get into how do we do this. I'm going to pull up Maya. So I have a mock-up here basically of a tiny branch and just the camera. And I'm going to show basically how I did this workflow. Um, I actually I use the camera turned on its side because it gives me more information. So if I was to actually flip this camera like this, um, that's actually closer to what my setup would actually look like, something like that. So you get more length in here. Um, but for illustration purposes, I'll just leave it like so. OK, so basically, uh, I'm going to go ahead and take pictures of this up the length of it. But what I do is I set the camera up on a tripod and I rotate this object 360 degrees and I do it in 10 degrees increments now I have an actual machine built to do this and if you want to see an overview of uh, what that would look like uh, go ahead and click on this video here but otherwise um, basically you can do this uh, without all of that stuff just having this thing set up on a little platform and uh, like a lazy Susan that you turn and you can go ahead and kind of measure out with a tape measure uh, the increments and how many turns you want to get so what we need to do though is you know we do 360 and uh, we turn it at 10 degrees so we should be getting 36 pictures uh, on every single level that we do but so we do level one let's say this is level one and then we're gonna move the camera up to basically like level two and then we're going to move it up to like level three. It's a very small object. So we I've gotten away with only doing three levels in this case. If it was a larger tree, I might need to do more um, levels going up because just the distance that it takes. Uh, now, how do we figure out like how much do we need to go up each time? Well, the way I do this is I will pick a specific detail that's, let's say, at the bottom of the frame here. Um, and I will make sure that in the well, let's actually let's go from here. It'll be like closer to the top of the frame here. We'll say I'll pick this detail here, this little green uh, fungus, whatever that is, lichen. And I'll make sure that if it's at if it's towards the top of the frame here, that the next round it'll be somewhere like there. So it's it's just below the center. And so that way I know I'm getting overlap. And the first set of pictures. Uh, we'll also have the same thing in here and so then the second set of pictures will uh, be able to see that and the photogrammetry software can can make contrast points and figure out where these things are in space by those different sets and then of course uh, i will go and look at something else like maybe this little sharp um, divot right there and i'll go ahead and go up and then i'll make sure that that sharp divot is also in the pictures here and so as long as you have overlap like that and you have the overlap going around in the circle with, uh, you know, the small increments, you should be able to get uh, good information that will actually give you a, you know, a result that will be uh, stellar. OK, so this is an example of three of the pictures that I took from the three different levels. So this would be let's call this like level one and then this is level two and then this is level three. So in level one, like I circled this little detail right there, and then I pointed out where it was in level two. So that's the same detail. Uh, you could also tell because there's like this little round divot right there, and that's right there as well. And then from here, I looked at something that's on the bottom here, this 
was sticking out to me. And then I looked over here and said, okay, that's in there as well. So now we have the overlap of going in the vertical direction. And then of course, um, we're gonna have it turn. And this is my Edelkrone uh, head one that basically turns it in the increments for me. But if you don't have something like that, I actually have a video on how to make your own platform from scratch just with some stuff from the hardware store. And you can check that video out here. Anyway, we go ahead and we get these pictures done. And then we have a whole array of pictures. And so the next thing we wanna do is once we have those, we actually want to bring those into Photoshop and we wanna post process those. So you can use Photoshop, you can use Lightroom, you can use DxO Photo Lab. That's actually, I like to use DxO Photo Lab a lot, but since most people have access to Photoshop over DxO, uh, I'm gonna do it in Photoshop today. So I'll go ahead and bring up my, my images here. Uh, these are the uh, post-process ones that I'm showing you, but I'm gonna show you the ones that are not post-process. These are the raw ones inside of here. And I'm gonna go ahead and drag these into Photoshop. So I'll just select the top one, hold shift, and select the bottom one. I'm just gonna go ahead and drag it up into Photoshop. If you notice, I try to drag it up into the top here because um, if you drag any random uh, picture into Photoshop on top of another, picture it will actually try to embed it into that file so I, I like to pull it above okay this is what I was expecting all right so we have these coming up in here give them a second to load let's expand this out and we need to process these so that they're nice and sharp and they're flat and the, we have a proper white balance and all of this stuff may seem a lot but it's actually really not that hard to do that. So I'm just gonna sample, I'm gonna sample this white area back here as my white balance. So I'm just gonna go ahead and sample that. And you can see like the, the way the picture looks now is a lot different. It's, uh, it looks, you know, it doesn't look greenish anymore. It actually has like a white cast to it. Uh, that's what we want. And I'm just gonna work on this first picture and then I'm gonna copy the information from the first picture and paste it to all the other pictures. Uh, so what I want to do is typically to flatten out this for the color, uh, I go ahead and I drop the highlights all the way down and I'll take the shadows all the way up. So let's see what that looks like. Let's zoom in here a little bit more. So what happens is we're getting like more of a flat look to it. And typically, you know, depending on the object, I might actually only do it at like uh, negative 50 for the highlights and negative 50 for the uh, the shadows and that might be enough because I like to keep um, you know you want to keep the fidelity of the picture too so sometimes uh, sometimes I'll go all the way down and all the way up and sometimes I won't it just depends and then I'll take the whites I'll brought, bring the whites down to maybe like 25 or so and if I can get it 26 hmm, close enough so and then we'll put that at 26 I'm putting the blacks at 26 so now it's gonna give me more of a flat diffuse color. And uh, I've still got a ton of detail though. You can see how much detail's in there. So speaking of detail, let's go ahead and in this case, I'm gonna enhance the detail a little bit. If you're working on something that had, like, like humans that have skin, you usually don't wanna turn up the texture or clarity or dehaze. But in something like this, it actually will help. So if I, if I go in closer to here, and if I take the texture down, you can see if I bring it below, it actually kind of smooths it out. Um, but if you bring it up just a little bit, it's a really nice micro contrast that you can get on something like this, which is actually good for, for a wood like this. But don't go too crazy with these. I, I keep them very low, just a little bit. Uh, I also might bump up the uh, contrast a little bit, which is right here underneath the exposure. You can bump that up just a little bit. Okay, and the other thing you might want to do is go into the optics here and turn on remove chromatic aberration. Uh, oops, don't do not do this one. Do not put on use profile correction. Uh, I, I've seen people who thought you, you're supposed to do that, but no, actually, when you're running this through the photogrammetry software, you want the original optics, uh, whatever it comes out like, and you don't want to run it through uh, a, a correction. But I'm just going to remove the uh, chromatic aberration. And that 
that should be it. You know, you have a sharpening in here. You have a noise reduction. This noise reduction is good for if you're doing humans, like for skin, and you want to turn the sharpening down if you're doing humans. But that's not what we're doing today. So we actually want it nice and sharp and kind of gritty. So um, okay, that looks good. And I can right click over this and say copy edit settings, and then I can hit Control A. It'll select all of the pictures, and then I can just go ahead and right click again and say paste edit settings. And now you can see all of them are getting pasted in there. And so they're all changing. And give it a second. We'll go through and just make sure it's all. Yep, it's doing it to all of them. OK, great. So let's go ahead and export those. We go up to this little button on the upper right corner. And we say we're going to convert these. I'm just going to convert them to JPEGs. Uh, these raw files are really big. And honestly, I don't typically need to keep all of those. Some people like, you know, are purist about the raw files and they want it to be the highest grade and they'll like export TIFFs and stuff and they'll be really, really large files. I have found that in my experience doing TIFFs or doing uh, a raw DNG or doing uh, JPEGs, I've not really been able to see the difference. So if you do a high quality JPEG, it's a lot smaller and I don't really get the difference. If I was doing something that, you know, maybe for whatever reason needed that just extra tiny bump in fidelity, I might, you know, might do it with the raw or the TIFF or something like that. But in this case, I'm not gonna worry about it. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna pick where I want this to go. All right, there we go. And say select. And then you want to make sure that you have the quality at 12. OK, and the format is JPEG. So JPEG, like I said, you can choose other other stuff in here. But I've found that it works just fine with the JPEG. I've done comparisons and it seems to be the same. So I'm going to go ahead and hit save. And then it's going to go through and just kick all these out. And when this blue bar fills, that's when you're done. So we have to wait a minute and see what happens next. OK, so while that's exporting, I just want to show you this is the lens that I'm using. It's a Sony 30 millimeter macro. It's an APS-C lens, so it's not for full frame. Um, I mean, you can use it on full frame, but it'll it'll go into crop mode on your camera. Uh, this is the camera. It's an a6400. Uh, I actually have a, a number of these that I use in an array. And uh, I so I can fire all the pictures at once. But uh, you can do this with just one camera. You can do this with your cell phone. Uh, if you have a cell phone, you probably want to get like a little tripod mount for the cell phone and uh, and remote trigger it. I actually have a cell phone um, tripod mount with a remote trigger. It's it was only like maybe 20 bucks on Amazon. So um, those are the kind of things that you want to do. We've already gotten our photos that are exported, so we can actually go in and start looking at those. So let's jump back. We'll go into process two here. And let's hit cancel here. Actually, I should, sorry, I should do this done. I don't need to cancel. So we'll minimize that. And then we'll bring up AggieSoft. And I'll just go ahead and make a new, new file here. And let's get this over to the side here. And so what I do with this now is, you know, I can look at them, just make sure they're good. Looks fine. OK, uh, I'm going to take all of them, hit Control A, and I'm just going to drag these into the first chunk. So there we go. And so it's 108 images. I can minimize that now, maximize this. You can see they're coming in at the bottom. I actually have found as long as you have a nice, like, plain backdrop in the back like a like either plain black or plain white i like to use white for these because there's kind of like sometimes there's dark black in the actual uh, in the bark um so as long as you have this plain backdrop i don't do much processing like i'll just basically um kind of go lazy with this i just do an align photos um i usually do it the highest uh but you can do it at high uh, it all depends on how large your photos are if you have like if you're using your cell phone and you're doing like 12 megapixel pictures i would definitely do it on the highest uh if you're doing anything that's like 18 megapixels and maybe larger you could probably work with high and it would be fine because what this does is the highest takes the full resolution of the ob of the uh the picture the highest takes like a half resolution and medium and low basically just keep going down by half 
So if you go ahead and have it at the highest, you're going to have the most chances that it will match points up and stuff like that. Uh, in my advanced, I almost always turn this up. Uh, it starts off, I think, at 40,000 by default and 10,000. And I always turn this up to like either 80 or 100,000. I just seem like, like I get <clears throat> I get more points uh, for the camera alignment and it seems to work a lot better. So just have it set like this and hit OK. And then you got to wait a few minutes while it finds all the different contrast points between the pictures and tries to align the cameras up. All right, so let's wait. OK. I would say it took about three minutes to process and this is what we have and this is only I think it was uh, like 11 centimeters in circumference so it's a it's a very very small branch you can see the edelkrones right there so let's go ahead and just clean this up a little bit Normally, if I'm doing something that requires a lot of um, TLC, we'll call it, uh, I'll go in and I'll start, you know, deleting out these little points on the side, and then I'll realign the cameras and stuff like that. Uh, I'll do that in a different video, but for this one, I just want to show how, like, really, I'm not going to do any realignment, and it's going to work out just fine. I've done this enough times to know that um, it'll work out with stuff like the tree branch. Th these are really good things to start photogrammetry with because there's a ton of contrast, there's no shininess, uh, and it just usually works out. Um, by the way, I hit five on my keyboard to go into orthographic mode and I'm gonna hit three. And then I'm gonna start rotating and moving this, uh, this around so that it's oriented the right way in the world. So I'm gonna go to rotate object here and I'm just gonna do something like that. And then I'll go to move object and I'll go something like that. Now I don't want anything that's below here. So I'll get rid of that later. I'm going to go ahead and go and hit one on my keyboard, which is going to put me in the top view. And I'm going to look for this little X right here in the grid. And I'm going to move this to where that X is because that's the center of the world. So something kind of like that. I'm going to hit seven on my keyboard and it goes just into a different view and i'm just going to look at it from this view too and everything looks fine so now what we want to do is we're going to limit the region uh, so i'm going to go ahead and go rotate region and what this is is basically this is the area that you know the computer will be looking at to solve the photogrammetry scan and so what i i want to be in orthographic because it's much easier to see whether or not you're you know aligned properly and I basically just want to get this thing so it's wrapping right around this uh, this object and I'm having a hard time here. <laughs> okay, so let's go to resize region and you can just click and pull on these little blue tick marks in the corner and we just go like that. And then I'm gonna to go to the other view and do it in the other view as well. So I'll hit one, or I'm sorry, I'm gonna hit three on my keyboard. We'll do it in this view and I'll bring this in like so and like that and maybe just take it a little bit lower like so. So this area here that is the edelkrone and the little spike going up into the wood, this will not get built because this domain that we're establishing here will only, will, will basically limit where it's going to build things. So now if I want, I can hit five on my keyboard, get out of the orthographic. I can go back to my little um, widget tool here. I can double click on this. And then if you click inside this tool here, you just click to rotate. So you can just turn in any direction. You can double click here and it will center the rotation down there. I can roll my middle mouse in and out to uh, to just look at this and make sure, yeah, this looks good. This is the alignment I want. Okay, next step. So the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a build mesh. Uh, there's not a ton of pictures, so it should build pretty fast. Uh, and the way that I do this, uh, you know, I've done this enough, so I kind of know I'm almost positive it's gonna turn out great. So I actually will go and put this at uh, the ultra high right away 
if I know it's going to turn out good and then I will turn it to custom and then I put zero in here which basically makes it so that it doesn't do any kind of uh, decimation so you get the full resolution mesh that's why I was getting 133 million polygons but if your computer's not really really fast and and you don't have like a lot of RAM and stuff like that uh, or a really good graphics card I would basically suggest starting with high or medium um, when you're doing these builds and just limit you know you could do the face count at high as well but um, doing it at ultra high at zero I would do some tests before you go into that that little uh, experiment <laughs> you know do some lower ones first so I'm just gonna hit OK and it's gonna go through and build this with this I'm gonna guess it's gonna take about 20 minutes on my computer uh, you know mileage may vary based on how fast your computer is so that means more waiting okay it took a little bit longer than I expected more like 30 35 minutes or so and these are the results let's get closer it's got 40 million polys uh, you can see a lot of detail let's go ahead and look at the shaded view or the solid view I should say You see these little ridges that are in there. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Okay, so we've got that. Let's get to the next step. And the next thing I want to do is I need a lower poly version of this so I can build a mesh to bake out to. So let's go ahead and get to that. All right, so that's not too hard to do. We just come into mesh here under tools and we're gonna say decimate mesh. And uh, 10,000 is fine. You could probably do it even lower, but uh, let's just say okay. It's gonna say, do you wanna replace the default model? I do not, so I'm gonna say no. And it'll make a second mesh and that will be saved out in my little area over here. Okay, so here's the decimated mesh, and you can see this in the workspace 900 and sorry, 9,999 faces. And we can go ahead and look at the wireframe if we want. You can see how much lower poly that obviously is. And that's that's good to go. All right, so what we need to do now is just get this thing out. We'll go ahead and say file export export model and let's make sure we're in the right spot this is this one right here and so we'll call this uh, Bush Ridge and I'll usually do something like this I'll put like 10k and that usually lets me know that it's my decimated mesh I don't need the vertex color, so I'm unchecking that. But if I am bringing this into ZBrush or something where I want those, I might I might have that checked. So I'll say OK. And then we come back into Maya. OK. All right, so we're in Maya. And we just go ahead and say, I'm going to go ahead and just save this scene and then do a new scene. So new scene. Let's get the grid out. And we'll say import our obj select it hit f on the keyboard to frame it we can see what we got okay it looks actually like the size might be pretty accurate i'm not 100 percent sure uh, but that doesn't really matter that much i'm going to go ahead and first thing just go into my attribute editor and let's just do this so i can see this better i'm going to turn the color down and take the ambient color down and now we can actually see it there we go all right so for baking from aggie soft meta shape we need to have a mesh that is just inside of this mesh in other programs you can have the mesh outside and aggie soft actually works with the mesh outside except for the displacement maps so for some reason Agisoft requires that the displacement map is inside this mesh. So I do a little, you know, build of a simple cylinder that basically goes just inside of this, and then I bake from that. 
So I've got my cylinder and I'm going to go ahead and change this to about a hundred subdivisions. That would be 10. There we go. There's a hundred. And I'm going to go ahead and change the height. Let's say five or so. And the radius will be something like 0 0.25, something like that. Pretty close. Okay. Now I'm going to hand adjust a bunch of this stuff too, but I like to just dial those things in first. And this is pretty close. Now what I need to also do is I have to put height subdivisions in here too. And when I do that, I want my, my little subdivisions to look like squares. That means that they will basically stick to this other mesh better and they're just, they're easier to manipulate. So I might change this to, I don't know, something like, well, let's try a hundred first. And apparently I don't know how to dial in a hundred today because I've done the same thing twice. So there we go. A hundred is probably not enough, but you know what? I'm looking at this since it's so small, I'm going to probably take this down. So let's take this down to like 50 and maybe take this up to like 150, something like that. There we go. So those are nice and square, pretty close. And we can go ahead and start working on the UVs. So let's go to the UV editor. Okay, UV editor. We don't need the top and bottom. So I'm just gonna come first of all and just go to my faces, double click on these and hit delete. Those are gone. Now I'm gonna take what I have here initially and I'm gonna go and just do an unfold. And it's gonna come out something like that. I'm gonna hit optimize really quick. And then I'm going to go ahead and orient shell. Now, for some reason, it likes to turn it this way, which is not what I want. So I'm just going to check which is the top. And that's the top. So let's go ahead and take this transform and we'll turn it like that. And then just hit the layout and it will basically lay it out nice like that. Now, I want to look and see where I'm hitting on the grid here. So this is the 0.35 mark and I'm going to either have this go to the 0.5 mark or the 0.25 mark. The reason why I do that is I basically bake the texture out so it's like an 8k by either 2k or 4k it depends on the piece that I'm doing and in this case it's so small and skinny it's probably going to be an 8k by 2k. Uh, I like to do it that way so that it tiles uh, in the Y direction uh, more times, if you will, or let's say, let's say this, you won't see the tiling as much because it'll have uh, more information going in the Y direction. So for me to do that, let's go ahead and just now we're going to adjust the size of this by hand. I'm just going to scale this and let's go ahead and just scale it out a little bit like so. And actually we're pretty close right there. So I'm just going to move that down just a tad like that maybe move it over a little bit like so okay obviously we've got like this bend going on so let's go ahead and get that so it fits in there I'm gonna go into deform and put a lattice deformer on there so lattice and I've got 10 going in the up and down direction let's do 15 say apply and then from here, you know, actually I'm looking at this. I wonder if a, a little bend would just do it, but we'll just use a lattice since I already got it on there. We go to the lattice points, hit right click and drag to lattice points. And then I can start taking this and just sort of fitting this onto the profile of this twig. Now, if you're doing something larger, all of the same steps can be applied. I just like to show how much detail you can get with a, like a macro type workflow because you know it, it's easier in the sense that you can go outside and grab a little twig off a tree and get some amazing detail. <laughs> it's it's quite awesome, and uh, you can even you know I don't know if we would want to use it as a tree trunk. A uh, little twig because trunks and twigs do look a, a little bit different but it's possible with the amount of detail you get off of this that you could do that 
So we'll go like this, pull this like that, and then I'm just going to sort of go ahead and adjust it in a different direction now, make sure that it's hitting this direction as well. As you can see, it's sort of engulfed inside of this thing. Now, <clears throat> I could bring this into, uh, you know, Substance or Marmoset or, you know, just some other baking tool and bake out these maps. Uh, but the poly count is so high that when I bring it into Substance, I've had Substance like fail uh, trying to bake certain maps. And I think it's just because it's just, it can't handle, you know, 40 million polygons or whatever. Uh, or at least in my experience, I've tried like, you know, some of my really high ones, like 100 million polygons and Substance just can't handle it. <laughs> so Aggiesoft can, so that's why I'm going through this. This uh, I wouldn't really probably have to do all this if I could get it into a different program. Um, and, I'm, and I do have Marmoset, but a lot of people don't. Uh, and you know you can probably use X normals. I'm sure that's still out there. I haven't used it in a while, but X normals would work. Um, that might be able to handle the poly count. And if you're, you know, if you don't know if you're hitting these, you can just hit four on your keyboard, so you know where like where you're adjusting this to. So that's maybe a better idea. The only thing is I can't see if it's sticking through the mesh when I do this. It's harder to tell, but I can tell if I'm selecting everything. All the points that is okay so we hit five on the keyboard come back to this view and that's actually pretty good that's pretty good okay I don't see the other mesh sticking through if you want to check it a good way to check it would be to grab something like this and right click go to assign new material just put something like a uh, this could be a blend or a Lambert on there. Where's the Lambert? There we go. And then let's just change it so it's basically like a red color or something like that. It's going to say red. And then if it's sticking through the mesh at all, we'll be able to see that. And you can see it's not. It's it's pretty good. Okay, at this point I go ahead and make a duplicate of this. So I'm, I'm going to keep the original with the lattice on it, but I'm just going to hit Control D and make a duplicate. And then I'll go ahead and hide the lattice version. So I'll just go ahead and put it in a group, Control G, select all of them, Control G, and then I'll just hit Control H and hide it for now. I've got this one right here. And this would probably work just fine. However, what I do like to do as well is I will go ahead and do a average verts on it really quick just to kind of smooth everything out so um all the adjustments i made there's no like really major kinks or anything like that all right let's go ahead and look at this okay so we can look at this control one we can see it uh, it's not too kinky or anything from the little moves we made because we averaged the verts but uh there is a, a kind of a thing that we have to deal with with uh baking from aggiesoft and that is that Aggiesoft doesn't give you fine control over how far the rays shoot out. So I've had errors come up if I didn't have this mesh like really close to the other mesh. And uh, I think it's probably a best idea just to snap this to the other mesh and get it really, really close to the same size so that we don't run into those kind of problems. Um, to do that, if I was to go ahead and take this and just grab all the verts, uh, Oops, I grabbed the wrong one. Actually, let's grab let's grab this mesh first and we'll make it a live surface by just hitting that button. And then I grab all these verts. And if I was to go ahead and just start to scale this, boom, you can see it'll snap to the outer surface and then we can do an average from there. The only problem is is that because there's a top on here, you can see these verts here are trying to snap to the top. So uh, it's probably a better idea if we just turn off the live surface and just basically slice the top of this off. So I'm going to go to an orthographic view, like maybe the right side or something like that, and get my cut tool out. And 
let's see here. We'll need this little work panel because we want to turn off or turn on, I think it's ex extract face. I think that's the one. And then when we actually do a cut, uh, it'll it'll actually cut the face off. I'm going to a different view because I think this will work better. Okay, so we click outside of the mesh and then just drag like so through the mesh. And you can see it's gonna do like this slice. And wow, that was strange. Let's see here. Slice along plane. I've never seen it do that before. Well, you learn something new every day. What did that do? Let's see there. It cut it and then it dropped it. It made it like <laughs> drop really low. Ah, strange. Okay. Um, hmm. Never seen that before. I'm not sure if I did something different or my settings are different or the tool needs to be reset. Matters not. We will just move it up a little bit. That's a new one for me. Okay, so now we just want to delete that. And so now we can see. So what would happen here if I bake this Maggie soft? Like some of these really far uh, faces might not might not get the information that they're supposed to get. Uh, like in substance, you can actually set uh, how far you want the rays to go. However, even that has a limit. It doesn't let you go like out forever. So that could be problematic in, in there too. So now we just go back to making this a live surface. Just click that on, grab this, grab the verts. And then we just go ahead and just do a little bit of a scale on it. And the top was not supposed to do that. Uh, let's do this. Let's, uh, Let's move the live surface up just a tiny bit. So you have to turn the live surface off to move it. And then let's move it up just a tiny bit like that. Yeah, that should work better. Now let's do the same thing that we did before. This is all troubleshooting. And a lot of CG is troubleshooting. <laughs> Things come up. Let's snap it. There we go. See, no problem now. It was just a little bit too low. Okay, so now we can turn off the live surface, hide that. We won't need that probably anymore. So I'm gonna hit Control H and just hide it for right now. And now I need to relax the rest of this thing. And the only problem what happens is, is that when you start doing the average vertices to kind of relax the UVs, or I'm sorry, relax the mesh itself, um, it starts to shrink the top into here. And so then it doesn't align properly with what you have inside of the UVs. And then you can get into that mess of trying to adjust the two. So what I'm going to do is let's just close that. I'm going to go ahead and average everything but the top and bottom. So I'll just select the top and bottom and then I'll do a control shift I, which will invert the selection. And so you can see here, the top is not selected, nay, the bottom. Okay, so let's do that. Average verts. And you can see how that smoothed out a lot of the, you know, the mesh. We'll do it one more time. I'll just hit G. And that's looking pretty good. One more time, maybe. Like three should be good. Okay, and now we'll go ahead and go back to object mode. I'm going to turn on the distortion map here. It'll actually like tell me if there's major distortions. And as you can see, it's mostly white. There's a faint amount of like pink and a faint amount of light blue, but that's okay. If I was to have something like, let me show you an example of what would be bad. Well, we'll probably need more than that. Let's go like that. Like stuff like that would not be good, you know? Um, but we don't have anything that's that bad. So I'm going to say that this is probably a, a mesh that's good to go. OK, so I want to show you something before. I know I've, I've just jumped into Metashape, but I want to show you something, a problem that's occurring. Uh, in Metashape, if the shape is too close to the outer mesh, uh, you get this black 
edge in the displacement or like it, it kind of like shades this almost like it's occluded or something. Um, if we just drop the mesh in a little bit more, then uh, we get a nice displacement map. So uh, jumping back to Maya, this is the mesh that was giving the problem. So to fix this, we want to do a transform vertices. And what this allows you to do is to push all of the components along their normals. So I'm going to go ahead with the Z direction, which is the blue arrow. And I'm just going to push these in a little bit like that. Uh, not too much so that it's not too far, but also uh, make sure, you know, there is some space there. Uh, this is just, you know, tricky, tricky stuff for this, uh, for this uh, baking method, just because uh, the meta shape baking is a little bit in its infancy, it seems, at least the displacement, they just added the displacement recently. So um, you need to have like, just that little bit of space there. And that should allow it to be uh, to work correctly. So we just go to object mode now, uh, delete your history, freeze your transformations, all that good stuff, and then export selection. And then I can export it over my mesh. So my bake mesh is how I'm naming it. And then coming into AggieSoft, um, I'll go ahead and just start from scratch here and say import, say import model. And I'm gonna grab that bake mesh, say open, say okay. And it's asking me if I want to uh, replace this. I'm going to say no. And I'm just going to bring it in new. And I'm going to actually take my old ones uh, that I was doing tests with and just remove those. New model. Yes. Okay. So now I've got this. Uh, this is the new one. And the first thing I want to bake is I'm going to bake the, uh, the displacement map because I want to check and make sure that I move this in enough. If it comes out with like a black edge, then that means that I'm not moved in enough. It's a weird quirk. It normally something like this shouldn't happen, but like I said, they just added the displacement baking from Metashape and it's just not quite perfect yet. I'll have to wait a few minutes for this to go and then, uh, and then I'll show you the result. Okay, so I've checked it. The displacement map is looking fine. It's not coming out with a dark edge on it. So that is good. All right, let's get to the next part. We're gonna go to build texture. I'll change it to the diffuse map. It wants to change it to the images by default. You wanna make it the 40 million poly or the high poly uh, to bake from because uh, the mesh here is not completely aligned with the other mesh and so you get issues with um, the projections not working out perfectly, but this will work out just fine. It'll actually match whatever the displacement map looks like. So we'll say, okay. And then we wait for this to go. Okay, the diffuse is, is good. So what we wanna do is select model textured if you aren't able to see this yet. So you go into model texture and then just click on diffuse underneath it. And then it will switch over and you'll be able to see what you've got. Uh, I want to note something really quick on the displacement map. Um, see, there is a little bit of a black edge right here, right at the tippy tippy top. And uh, there's probably one at the bottom too, maybe a little bit. Not so much on the bottom, the, the bottom's better. But we're gonna be tiling this in the vertical direction. So we'll go ahead and mask that out anyway. So that shouldn't be an issue. Okay, so we got to just go through and do the rest of the textures. So build texture, and then you want to do your normal map, and it's got the right model picked, and say OK. All right, let's look at that normal map. There we go. That is some high fidelity. All right, let's get the next one which is the ambient occlusion. That's the one that will take the longest. So before I do that, I'll actually just go ahead and start exporting these. So I'll say export, export texture. And I'm gonna export them as PNGs except for the displacement map, that will be a TIF. Uh, so let's go ahead and just say, we'll do the color first, say save. It already exists, that's okay. We wanna save the alpha channel. We'll find out uh, later why that is. And then diffuse map, and say okay. And that'll go ahead and export that. I'm gonna do the same thing for the normal 
and the AO, and then I'll show you how I do the displacement map right after this thing exports. Okay, so the displacement map, we will export texture, change it to TIFF. And the reason why we do it as a TIFF is because it's gonna come out as a 32-bit, and that'll have a lot more levels of gradation. That's what you want for uh, displace displacement, either 32 or 16-bit. So we'll just go like that, say save. It's gonna say there's one already there because I already saved one before. Just pick displacement in the list and say okay. And there we go. We'll do the normal. Okay. And then while I'm working in Photoshop, I can go ahead and start building the ambient inclusion. That takes a little bit longer just because of the ray casting it has to do. So we'll say okay. Let it start building in the background. We could hit minimize here. And okay, so we're in Photoshop. Let's open up our files. Let's go to the export files. And we'll just grab all of them. Let's hit open. <clears throat> And let's see what we got here. Okay, so we want to crop them first. So we just grab a crop tool and uh, make sure you snap it if you don't have your snaps on. Right there. All right, so we check that. Let's check it. Control Alt I. 4K by 8K. Perfect. So we can close that. Just want to check it and make sure it's the right size. And I'm going to go here and do the same thing here. Check it. Okay. I check each one just because, you know, you never know if you might accidentally not get all the pixels you're looking for or get too many for that matter. And then here's our AO. Okay. Now we got everything ready to go. All right, let's talk about what we need to do. We need to tile in the Y direction, not the X direction, because uh, if we go ahead and go to offset and go ahead and put this at uh, 2048 by 1020, well, I'm sorry, 4096. There we go. Okay. So I just, I'm tiling this just to show you that um, there is, you know, a ridge that you see from top to bottom, but from side to side, nothing because it wraps around perfectly. So we don't actually even need to mess with the horizontal. We could leave that at zero. And what we could do, I'm actually going to hit cancel. Um, well, I'll hit okay. And then uh, I'll just hit control Z. I'm going to make a duplicate of this. I'll just drag it down into duplicating the layer. And I will go ahead and I'm going to drop the opacity down to about 50. Okay, so the reason why I'm doing this is because I want to go to the offset and I want to play around with this tiling and see where I feel like these ridges might match up best. And the reason why. Uh, I chose this kind of texture to keep working with was it's actually really challenging to do to get something like this to tile properly because you have these very distinct ridges and they kind of spiral a little bit as they go up. So what I want to do is uh, just show some tricks of like how I would get this to tile. So I'm going to go ahead and just actually you can see right here. Well, it's it looks almost the same because it's almost right on top of the original. But as you're getting closer to the top here, um, you're getting some interesting uh, areas where they're not they're not looking like they're overlapping um, too poorly. And zero. Let's go down to the bottom too and check and see. If there's anything good so you can see like right here this is starting to sort of um, like if this converged with this one and this converged with that one 
That would be nice. Of course, we wouldn't be that lucky now, would we? So I'm just kind of interactively changing this just to see what I end up with. And um, surprise, surprise, I actually went through and played with this earlier and found some numbers that worked uh, so that I didn't have to sit here too long with you uh, showing these. So I'm going to actually dial those numbers in. We'll leave that at 1267 and I'll put this at 144. So I'm actually going to rotate uh, on the horizontal a little bit and you can see what happened here is that it shifted these so some of them seem like now they're aligning really really well and as long as we don't mess with the tiling that's going off of the edges here we should be fine so now if I pull the opacity all the way up we can see that this is where the the ridge is right here at top and if we kind of like hide that back and forth and what I end up doing is I end up like going and dropping the opacity a little bit and seeing where I've got these things to kind of merge together and uh, and then I drop a mask on here and then I'll just get a paintbrush out and let me right click and show you I've got a soft round for this texture the soft round works good uh, sometimes you need to use a like a different kind of brush that has like kind of harder edges or sort of a textured edge but uh, for this one it, it, the soft brush is probably the best that I found and so what I'll start doing is uh, just painting some black in here to the mask so I can reveal what's underneath and so sometimes it's hard to tell which one is the top and which one's the bottom so um, this is the top one here so I actually I actually want to sort of leave that um, but see, we're going to paint that in like that. And then let's see how that looks. That looks pretty good. And so we're just trying to get rid of this little line that's in here. And we'll get to some tricky spots. Like, for instance, right here. There's a extra ridge that's like right on the side there. So um, I can decide just to leave that if I want and just say it's like, well, it's a, it's a natural anomaly, you know, and then just kind of keep going on with this. If you want to paint out, like you can see there's kind of another ridge there. You know, maybe you don't want that so much. You can paint some of it out. Let me go ahead and turn this all the way up again. So let me undo that. And we'll turn this up before we paint that out. So I might decide that like that section right there I don't really need and we'll use the background for this section right there. Now I don't know for sure how this is going to look in the other maps but I am going to transfer uh, to the other maps and um, you know that will be that'll be kind of the telltale but usually I like to use the normal map when you have like distinct type of, uh, of, of patterns in here because you can see where those patterns are. So here so this is one where this is coming right at this this is like sort of ending right here this this kind of like ridge looks like it's coming to an end right there so I'm going to make the brush smaller and just kind of paint just that little edge out right there and see if I can make that sort of match up and like I said I don't know exactly how good this is going to work until I check it in the other textures but uh, this is sort of the process. It's actually a lot easier with uh, like a regular bark that has kind of big flaky chunks and stuff like that because you can just sort of follow the chunks like the flakes and make sure that you just kind of cross over. Um, but this one's tricky because it has these very distinct ridges in it. Let's go ahead and lower this for a second. So... You know, if I wanted to, I think on the bottom, this one kind of doesn't go through. So I could probably, I could probably get like really small hair and just paint this one out completely. As you can see, it's like terminating right before it hits the end. That's sort of convenient for me. Hopefully this works good. 
But if it doesn't, I can just come back and, you know, it's in a mask, so I can always paint stuff back in. So I can make that nice and small. Something's going on there. Oh yeah, that's right. There's that little um, that little ridge. So let me do this. I don't want too much of that. So I'll change to my white. I can paint some of that stuff back in. It's right there where it starts to change weird. It's such a small detail though. I'm sure it probably won't come up as an issue. Let's just back this back off. Um, I think I'm okay with that. I'm gonna go ahead and hold control and click on my mask. And what it'll do is it'll select all the area that's been you know, painted on. So I can see over here where I haven't gotten. So I'll hit control D to deselect and then get my brush back out. And as I get close to the side, I get smaller and smaller because I don't want to mess with the uh, horizontal. Um, I gotta change back to my, uh, my black. By the way, I'm hitting X to transfer back and forth to black and white. So I'll just kind of paint a little bit out right to the edge there. So that seam is gone. And then I'll make the brush bigger as I get further away. Sort of fade right into that. Kind of like that. Oops, let's not go overboard. Let's see. Okay, so I'm going to turn this. Uh, well, actually, it's already turned up all the way. So let's look at it again. Okay. Now, if I want to check this to see what it looks like tiling, I can just hit Control A, Control Shift C, Control V, and what Control Shift C does is it it just copies everything you can see on the canvas. So now I can go ahead and just try tiling it again. So go back to Offset, and I'm going to uh, I'm not worried about the horizontal because I know that's was already correct, um, but I'll go ahead and just play with the vertical and see if I see anything that looks awkward. And it all looks pretty normal. I can't really tell the difference. So I'm just going to cancel and I'll check this out for right now. Now what I need to do is I need to be able to do the same process that I did before <clears throat> on the other, uh, on the other uh, textures. So like here's the displacement. So I have to go in here and make a copy first off and then do a filter other offset and then dial in the same numbers that i originally did which are still in there okay so we just leave it like that and then we'll go ahead and do the same thing here make a copy filter offset now that's done and here's the ao copy it offset okay so everything's the same let's go back to the normal then we go to channels and i'm going to go ahead and show uh, this mask here, just make sure it's visible. And then I'm going to hit control a with that mask selected. Uh, what just happened? What did I hit? Oh, I must've hit control X. I'm sorry. I went to hit control a, um, so I have it selected hit control a and then hit control C. And now I have this mask copied onto my clipboard and I can come into here, do the same thing, uh, as I did before make a mask and then come into here and then just paste it control V and you'll be able to see that right there so you can hide that show this and then you can take a look at at this uh, this job that we got going on here it's probably gonna look the worst in the displacement um, because the fact that you know you see value so easily with your eyes um, but when we do it in here let's put the uh, mask on there and we'll go ahead and hit control V paste that in there and then you can go ahead and take a look and see how that's looking and it's it's pretty good like you don't I mean there's a little bit of change but it changes over over the surface anyway so um, yeah it looks pretty decent it's hard to tell we'll, we'll know once we save it out and like load it up how well it will look okay so let's do that for the AO the AO is harder to see because it's so light uh, I might actually change that so Let's go into the channels though first and paste this in. Get that there. And so now we got that going on. So I'm gonna hit Control A, Control Shift C, 
control V, I'll paste a flattened uh, version of this. And then I'm just going to put a levels on this. Uh, let's do a levels. And watch this. We just pull this black all the way up to where that black information is starting. And you know, you could, if you want to get more AO, that's how you could do it. So you can just drop a levels on there through the uh, adjustment layers and leave it in there. So if you, you decide, no, I don't need that much or whatever, you can just take it out. But for fun, you can leave it on there. So let's go ahead and actually this this one's good to go then. I can, sh I can ship this. So I can go ahead and uh, do a save as copy. I'd like to do a save as copy instead of export because export always shows the, um, the interface and it takes forever. So I'm just gonna go, um, I'll actually, uh, you know what, I'll just leave it named like AO copy and say save. So I don't ruin the first one. Uh, what did I save that as? Okay, I did save it as a PNG. Okay, so uh, yeah, we can just save this one as well. File, save as copy, and a PNG. Now this one, okay, we have to do something different here. I'm gonna go ahead and change this mode. I'm gonna change it to 16 instead of 32. I don't think we need the 32 bit for this. 16 bit should be fine. Uh, I'm gonna hit don't merge and it'll just keep everything the same. And then I'll go ahead and export this out as well or save it as a copy. And that's perfect. Actually, okay, let me do this. I'm gonna hit Control E and collapse this because the copy doesn't need the extra layer and TIFFs will save extra layers in it. So I just want the flat one. And I don't want any compression, say okay, okay. And then uh, after that saves, I can undo so that I can go ahead and keep that extra layer in case I need it later. And then let's do this last one here, so. Just like to be able to see it like this. So file, save as copy, and there we go, save. Okay, now we don't have a roughness yet. So let's go ahead and, and put that together. Uh, I'm gonna go to the color one. This is what I usually use. I'm gonna do this all in Photoshop. Uh, you know, you can certainly go into Substance Painter or Substance Designer, I should say, it'd probably be better. And, and make some kind of cool roughness out of out of this. But uh, I can do that right inside of here. So let me just Control A, Control Shift C, Control V. I'm just pasting in a flattened copy. I'm gonna hit Control Shift U, which will uh, desaturate this. And, um, and then I'm gonna just make some extra layers here. So I'm gonna make two extra layers. Uh, one of them is going to be, I'm gonna go to Render and I'm gonna go to Fibers. And uh, I basically just use this to put like a little extra kind of, you know, variance into the, the, um, the roughness map. So I'll do something like this. I'll hit OK. And uh, this does not tile, by the way. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and just duplicate it. Uh, go filter, offset. And in this case, I'll do it uh, at... Let's see, 2048 by 4096. So I just want it tiling right in the middle. Oh, it looks like maybe it did tile from side to side. Oh, no, there is a line there. Okay, so this is easy. I made a copy so that all I have to do now is I can just come in with the brush and I can make a mask and then I can just start kind of going like this because this is it's so varied that it won't matter. I just want some like breakup in the in the uh, stuff in the uh, the stuff the bark stuff. <laughs> this is what happens when you stay up too late. Um, okay, so we're gonna do something like that, and like I said, when I get the brush closer to the edge, I'll make it a little bit smaller, and gonna do something like this. Do the same thing on this side. So if you're ever tiling textures that are like very nondescript and kind of just like pattern, you know, not descript patterns, but just, you know, just kind of like noisy, this is a easy way to do it is just make a duplicate and then tile it 
in half going both ways and then just erase out the middle like so and then what I'll do is I'll come down here and make sure we get all of this as well so if you don't know where that middle spot is just pull in a guide and then you can just follow that up okay let me zoom out a little bit because that'll go a lot faster so you can hit control minus to zoom out you can hold shift and just click and then drag down and it'll go in a straight line so shift And then your move tool will allow you to pull those uh, guides back off. Okay, so now this should tile up and down and side to side. And then I'm gonna go ahead and just collapse it into the other one, Control E. And the next thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna make a render clouds and that will tile automatically. So we don't have to do anything with that render clouds okay so uh, this is my first thing I'm going to do uh, I'm going to add a little bit of soft light in there with this variant so you can see how it's it's just kind of adding like some differentials all the way across and then we'll bring this in and this one I like pin light a little bit, but I usually go through and look. I'm usually looking to lighten if it's a if it's you know a rough surface. You're looking to add some lightness, but also in a way that's uh, that's going to break up the surface a little bit. So let's just drop this opacity, maybe like so, and then I'll take all three of these, just put them in a group. Control G, call it rough. And then I'm gonna put a levels over the top of it. So let's go ahead and add the levels. And then from here, I'll drive some white back into it. I'll limit the amount of black so it's not gonna be, you know, it's not gonna to be too shiny anywhere. And I can play with where the midpoint is, something like that. And that's probably pretty good. And so it will change here and there. Uh, some people like to invert this part, you know, and that's okay too. I think that either way, it's gonna look okay. I just like to break it up a little bit on the surface and you know, it's not gonna be shiny anywhere really. It's pretty, it's pretty bright. So let's go ahead and save this off, save as copy. <clears throat> and then this one we'll call rough. All right, and there we go. Okay, so let's see what it looks like. Finalized, all right. Boom, look at that, that was fast. Well, I had my other one that I, you know, my previous one that I basically figured out before I did the tutorial in Marmoset, and it's, it's pretty close to the same thing. Um, but I'll show you how you set this up in here. It's actually really easy. So I can go ahead and just, I'll go ahead and grab the, uh, the material. So I got my displacement map. You just have to make sure it's set to height in here. And I'll grab this displacement map. So that's this one. <laughs> Looks great. <laughs> we'll have to reset it. It always resets this when it does that. So we need to basically uh, configure that we probably don't need as much tessellation as it as it has right now. Huh, that's weird. It looks like the um, it looks a little bit different. I wonder what changed. It's weird. I think it didn't like that. Well, let's go ahead and throw the normal map in here. 
So you can see nothing's changing that much because I did pretty much the same, the same tiling and everything. So it's actually following along almost exactly the same. Okay, there we go. Now, if I could figure out why this thing went haywire, not really sure. It has something to do with, uh, let me grab the old one and see if it changes back. Uh, so this is the other one. You can't, you can't even tell the difference. Oh, but look, it's reading it differently. See, that's what's strange. So this one looks like it's actually reading it properly. Um, whereas the other one, something something was different about it because it wasn't showing up properly. Let's say open. See, it's showing up like this dark black and white. So let's see if we can troubleshoot what's going on there. This is grayscale 16. Let me undo that. Maybe just... I'll collapse it and save it as a 32 and see if that maybe fixes the problem. It'll take a second. Those are big files. Okay. Let's go ahead and okay, so it's just it just came back in and now it looks okay. I don't know, that's weird. It shouldn't have done anything different. I did the other one at 16, uh, 16 bit as well. So I'm not sure why this thing went haywire. Maybe it just, I don't know, didn't like what I was doing. Let's tessellate it a little bit more. And uh, if you want to really scale this thing, look at the fidelity there. That's fantastic. And it tiles well. Everything looks good. Well, that is how you get a photo real set of textures from photogrammetry and Photoshop. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Okay, well, that's it for this one. Thanks for watching.